empower me. Wow. Wisdom over wounds. September 4. His. They were yours. You gave them to me. John chapter 17, verse 6. A missionary is someone in whom the Holy Spirit has brought about this realization. You are not your own. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. To say, I am not my own, is to have reached a high point in my spiritual stature. The true nature of that life in actual everyday confusion is evident by the deliberate giving up of myself to another person through a sovereign decision. And that person is Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit interprets and explains the nature of Jesus to me to make me one with my Lord. Not that I might simply become a trophy for his showcase. Our Lord never sent any of his disciples out on the basis of what he had done for them. It was not until after the resurrection, when the disciples had perceived through the power of the Holy Spirit who Jesus really was, that he said, Go! Matthew 28, verse 19, also Luke 24, 49 and Acts 1 through 8. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26. He was not saying that this person cannot be good and upright, but that he cannot be someone over whom Jesus can write the word mine. Any one of the relationships our Lord mentions in this verse can compete with our relationship with him. I may prefer to belong to my mother or to my wife or to myself. But if that is the case, then Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple. This does not mean that I will not be saved but it does mean that I cannot be entirely His. Our Lord makes His disciple His very own possession, becoming responsible for Him. You shall be witnesses to me. Acts 1 verse 8. The desire that comes into a disciple is not one of doing anything for Jesus, but of being a perfect delight to him. The missionary secret is truly being able to say, I am his, and he is accomplishing his work and his purpose through me. Be entirely his. Wow. What a simple word. 
kids. Think about it for a second. Are you his? Father, I thank you for this simple word. Father, I thank you that as we grow, we have more and more understanding of who you are, what you are, and where you are. Father, I thank you that you long to live in our hearts and for us to belong to you. I thank you that your word was not saying that we could not have a mother or we cannot have children or we cannot have family. But what you were referring to is the type of attachments that come along with those connections. And us as being human sometimes forget that you have loan me that child or you have loaned me that wife or you have loaned me to my mother or to my father. I remember when I came to the reality concerning my grown children and God began to show me I'm bossing them around and telling them what to do and trying to give them instructions and stuff beyond what he had told them to do. I have children that are in ministry and there are times where God would give my children instructions. And often I'd find myself coming up against the instruction that they felt God had given them. Then I began to think back because I was a minister myself as a child. He's using the word missionary here, but it can be intertwined with evangelist, prophet, teacher, whatever you want to call yourself. But basically it's one who has a call to the service of the Lord. But I had a call on my life and I knew it solidly at the age of 12. And sometimes my mom or my dad would tell me to do some things that in my spirit was contrary to what God had told me to do. And that's why so many times I'm like, you got to be careful when you have children that are in ministry. You got to be watchful. You got to be prayerful because sometimes you might tell that child to do something and, and they try to explain to you, but mom, but dad, this this is what came to me. And, and, and you haul up and hit them and slap them and go sit them down and tell them to shut up and be quiet. Now my mom didn't do that to me. But some people do. And so you have to be cautious that you don't wound a child before they get of age and are able to make godly decisions. So God is saying that we belong to him. And I share this so often of that day. We, I have friends that are up in age and they're trying to tell their children what to do on a day-to-day -day basis and they're trying to boss them and I know they have good intentions but many times they have to go in a different direction than what you went in remembering that we are his and I remember the day when God told me he said you were just a babysitter your children don't belong to you they belong to me and I began to think about it. He says, yes, all I did was plant them into your womb because I trusted you with my child. I planted them in your womb and I allowed you to feed and nourish them and train them in the way that they should go. Because that's what the word of God say. Train them up in the way that they should go. And when they are old, listen to me, people, O-L-D, they shall not depart from it. It never said that they may not go astray. They may not wander. They may not go out to seek God for themselves and 
try to find a revelation for themselves. If we're under the impression that this child has to obey me for the rest of their life because I birthed them into the world, you are highly mistaken. I find so many parents that are hurt and distraught. I got parents on this line today. Thank you, Father. They're hurt and they're distraught and they don't know what to do instead of backing up and allowing their children to grow up and be grown and they are going to make their own mistakes like you made yours. That scripture, John 17 and 6 says, they were yours. You gave them to me. So God is basically saying, I loaned them to you. I remember the day came and I was married and I began to realize, I'm like, I, I don't belong to my husband as far as the spiritual life is concerned. I always belonged to God. God creates a union to where we are still supposed to flow in line with the power of God. Before you marry your wife, she should have been your sister in the Lord. Before you married your husband, he should have been your brother in the Lord. That mutual respect of your sister and your brother is united in marriage. But so many people came to the conclusion the man start being taught that you got to obey me and you got to do what I say. And even if they told you to do something that was out of order or out of the will of the Lord. If you have a woman who knows that God is her father, that she belongs to God, and you tell her to do something that is not in line with the word of God, then that's going to cause problems after a while. When you know yourself in the Lord, everybody just can't come and give you direction and boss you around and send you in a way that God hasn't sent you. Now, if you are a woman of God and you will marry a man that is a man of God, you have to be careful, just like the man does. You can't call them names. You can't belittle the man of God. You can't act silly and run out with your girlfriends and do whatever you want to do. You can't just jump up and spend money that both of you all earn and don't even take into consideration because I know how women are. We like to shop. That's why I'm saying that. You can't take and not take into consideration that man who was your brother in the Lord before you married him. See, God wants to keep us in line. For one thing, you don't often realize that your children are sitting right there watching the two of you act a act silly, act a fool. And you are planting seeds inside of your children that sometimes your daughter cannot have respect for men. Sometimes your men, your son, cannot respect women because of what they have seen you do in the home. And this is going to bless somebody today. I don't know who you are, father, sister, mother, brother, friend, acquaintance on this line today. But listen to Sister Barbara. Walk circumspectly before the Lord. Be respectful to your mates. Because they belong to God. They don't belong to you just because you give them a little ring and, and say, I do. You say, I do what? I do plan to respect you as a man or a woman of God. See, so many people are going to be in a lot of trouble when they come before the Lord. Because they can stand up in church and preach and sing and jump on videos and praise God and don't know how to treat their husbands or their wives. I'm not perfect. 
But the one thing you've got to understand is that you need to walk in forgiveness. You don't keep stuff on your back, men and women. When you do things that's out of order to your mates, you need to repent. Not only do you need to repent, but from your heart you need to say, I'm sorry. Because God is looking at your heart. And if you're planning secretly to do that again and to deceive your mate, God is watching you. God is going to hold you accountable for lying, not only abuse and mistreatment of your mate, but for lying to somebody that you came into unity with. You don't have the right to lie to your children. There's something about this lying thing that I'm, I'm even watching right now on TV. I'm watching attorneys and doctors and lawyers and regular people lie like it's nothing. The hearts are turned so far from God that you lie like it's a normal thing. No, it's, I mean, some of these people know they've been caught in lies, but guess what? They'll lie anyway. You know, what's that little saying they got out there now? You can't believe your lying eyes. So my eyes are lying to me and I saw you. My ears are tricking me and I heard you. The hearts have turned so far from the Lord that even amongst our people, we lie and cheat and still and still want to be considered his. God says, a liar shall not tarry in my sight. God, God doesn't even want to see you if you're a liar. We, you know, we forget the, oh, the, uh, the thou shall not steal. You reap what you sow. You step back in the church after you steal. And then when you go home, all your stuff is gone. You sit around looking funny like somebody stole from me. You planted a seed of theft, robbery, and you haven't repented. And you have no intentions of repenting. You know why you have no intentions of repenting? Because you plan to steal again. What you don't understand is that God is looking at your heart. Sometimes we steal and we get away with it so smoothly. Mr. Smooth. You steal and you get away with it so you build a pattern in your life of being smooth about it you have no guilt you have no condemnation because you walk back in the church and therefore there is no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus but you're not in Christ Jesus because that scripture goes on also to say who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. God didn't say, therefore there is now no condemnation to he who goes to church. The church is a building. But the church is supposed to be in us, instilled in our heart. He said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And I'm not talking about just in the body. I'm talking about in those fleshly ways. I'm talking about in the works of the flesh. Sure, there's a saying also. Stolen meat is sweet. And you have people that will steal your husband, steal your wife, steal sex from them, steal relationships from them, steal money from them, and not feel a thing. I knew this one man personally, and I knew 
he had more than 21 women that he was stealing from and smiling and chit-chatting and talking like he wasn't already busted by the Holy Spirit. 21 destructive people going to church laughing, dressed up like one of God's children. God forbid. God forbid. There are women doing the same thing. Tricking men just to get a pair of boots. I know you. Just to get a diamond ring. Just to get your hair did and your nails did. You give up the body and trick and deceive people just to get what you want. And be sitting on the organ, sitting up in the pulpit with your diamond on and your brand new Gucci bag. Or your brand new Dooney Burke bag. Preaching, teaching. Like you haven't been after somebody else's husband. Receiving all the goodies. And sitting there in covetousness. I was in a church at one time when somebody came in and so mad at the pastors and the pastor's wife brought in some pie. I believe it was two pies. Quiche. Quiche is what they were. For them to eat for dinner. And I remember saying, don't eat that. My spirit was like, don't eat that. Don't eat it. It looked good because I love quiche. Don't eat that. Don't eat that. One of the family members worked for the police department and they took that thing and they went and they checked it out and it was, I believe it was ground up glass in the quiche. You can't just gobble down and eat stuff that people send to you. Folks do all kinds of things to try and hurt you because you have what they want or they're jealous. But this is in the church. This is amongst people in general. When you don't win your tournament, you go and beat up somebody because you are jealous. Most people sitting around suicidal and wanting to die, you need to analyze what you're thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. What is it that ticked you off? What boyfriend you didn't get? What girlfriend you didn't get? Who ran off and left you? And left you in depression? I, I feel this in my spirit. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm putting somebody in check right now. You in there trying to kill yourself for the wrong reason. And the devil has carried this thing on and on and on because you were playing games in the first place. In the first place. God said, you belong to me. You don't belong to yourself. I love you. And I'm trying to help you, said the Lord. God didn't send his disciples out before they were ready. So many people play games for 40, 50 years that God cannot trust you even out on the field. Give you a proud position and before you get up in there, you're lying. You're cheating. You're stealing. You're doing the works of the flesh and making a mess amongst the people. God wants your heart. God wants your life. God wants you to come to him and say, 
Father, forgive me. Now, all the things that I've mentioned here today, God will forgive you. But along with the forgive you, there needs to be a change in your heart, a change in your mind, a change in your soul. Some of the people that followed Jesus, they were some bad boys. You know, Peter had his sword. He hopped off that man's, uh, chopped off that man's ear before you could blink. And all of a sudden you hear, Peter, Peter, hold on, Peter. You can't just go around chopping off people's ears. Jesus said, he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. You got all these guns and you ready to just shoot somebody. Guess what Jesus said? He who lives by the gun shall die by the gun. You going around stabbing people? Hear what Jesus said. He who lives by the knife, the sword, or the shard shall die by the knife, the sword, or the shard. Jesus didn't play no games. He made it very simple. In fact, he said the word of God is so simple that a fool, F-O-O-L, couldn't error. Are you a fool? Some people are like, oh, you can't say that word. Are you a fool? I remember the old folks used to say stuff, and I, I'm like, you know what? I understand it now as I've gotten older. I don't wish to be a Fool in error. Sometimes people look at you and think you're a fool. I'm like, do I look like a fool? Are you thinking? Are you conscious? Are you giving stuff to God? Or will you die a fool? An idiot. A fool will be always plotting and planning. I mean, you just need to spend some time and look up the word fool in the word of God and find out all the things God says about a fool. Are you his? Or are you running around being foolish? God wants to accomplish his work and his purpose through you. He wants you to be entirely his. What a simple topic. His. H-I-S. Entirely his. I thank you today for this simple word. Lord, empower me. Give me wisdom over all of my wounds, even the wounds I brought on myself, even the wounds from my self-pity party, even the wounds for someone who's been a smooth talker and tricked me and deceived me out of everything. Give it to God. Let it go. Repent and start over. We thank you today because you let us know that we are in the work of restoration. I come here to you today to restore you unto the Lord. Not to judge you or cause you to feel condemnation. But I come to give you the Spirit of restoration. Ah, restore, Lord. 
restore. Restore your children back unto you. Restore them at never before. And bring them to the place like you did your disciple. That once they know they belong to you and you belong to them. Then you can send them out as you did the disciples. And he says, now you shall be witnesses to me. Acts verse 1, chapter 1, verse 8. God needs you to be a witness to him. And I thank you, Father, that I am yours and you are mine. We give you glory and we give you praise today because you are the almighty one. As I often say, I didn't come on here to make you excited, happy, laugh, jump, and sing, but I came to leave a word of wisdom on your heart. If any of these messages bless you, because I'm not just posting pictures with nice little sayings, God gave me this series called Empower Me. Wow. Wisdom over wounds. If any of these short words, simple words, bless you, feel free to leave me a message, text, email me. I would love to hear any testimonies if God has brought you victory and set you free. May God bless you today. This is Sister Barbara. Go with God.